Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Amélie Safri, Assistant Cultural Programming Officer, and it's a pleasure to introduce the second day of lectures, organized in connection with the exhibition Alexander Calder, Radical Inventor. This retrospective features a number of Calder's key works on loan from museum and private collectors in the United States and France and from the Calder Foundation. These works range from remarkable sculptures from his childhood to maquettes for his monumental public sculptures. Public sculpture, excuse me. <laughs> in addition, visitors will have the opportunity to fully experience Calder's mobiles. During an event entitled Momentum, a small number of mobiles will be activated. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Griffin Rue, sound experimentalist, composer, performer, and curator in the field of audiovisual culture. Griffin Rue is also an expert on his great grandfather, Alexander Calder's use of sound in his practice, and the influence of the mobile on post war and contemporary music. In 2013, he wrote the essay, Calder and Son, which appears in the accompanying catalogue of the exhibition Alexander Calder, Avant-Garde in Motion, at Kunst Sammlung and RW in Dusseldorf. It was translated into Spanish for the exhibition Alexander Calder, Theatre of Encounters, which opened last month at Proa Foundation in Buenos Aires. In 2012-2013, he also co-curated the Calder Foundation's 12-hour projects, which involved continuous programming in non-traditional locations, such as a construction zone and a neo-Gothic refectory. These projects were cross-generational and cross-disciplinary works involving film, sound, static art installations and performances. In 2017, Griffin Rue was guest curator for the exhibitions Strange Tractor in the Ballroom Marfa, Texas, and Symbol Rush at the Clayton Gallery and Outlaw Art Museum, New York City. Griffin Rue leads the ensemble Vertical Foliage Orchestra, which performs electroacoustic music using percussive objects such as brass gongs, sheet metal, and aluminum scraps from Calder's studio, incorporating texts and statements made by Calder. He performs with the artist Benton Sin Bainbridge, creating atmospheres and moods from a musical soul, overtone singing, and video synthesizers to, in to create improvised light drawing. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our guest, Griffin Rue. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming, um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here in Montreal. Um, it's been quite a long while, and I've decided to stay on for a few more days um, to st see the city. Um, and uh, I, I would like to thank also Anne and Beth for inviting me, and, and Genevieve, Emily, and Danielle for your warm reception and assistance to making this trip happen. Um, I wanted to ask straight off, how many of you have seen the exhibition so far? Great, I haven't seen the exhibition personally, <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I did catch the curator Beth's um, wonderful uh, talk yesterday um, on my great-grandfather's um, tra uh, uh, transatlantic development as, a, as an artist, um, back and forth from Europe and um, uh, New England and uh, New York. Um, here he is in uh, 1940, I believe, in um, Roxbury, Connecticut, in his workshop, his studio, um, which was a former ice house that he converted into um, a big studio. And I wanted to just begin with this image because here he is as an adult um, with, with these gongs, which are one, to three, and maybe some, some other gongs kind of hidden away here and there, but incorporated into his mobiles. Um, it's, it's an area of interest of mine of how he incorporated sound and music into his sculptures. And 
in my opinion, it's been underexplored in terms of his body of work. Um, so I'm going to kind of begin this presentation um, by uh, with, with his roots as an avant-garde artist in Paris and some of the things that happened to him which um, were instrumental in incorporating these ideas of how do you incorporate noise into sculpture, how do you incorporate motion into sculpture. Um, and uh, so the talk is going to focus on him as a, as a pioneer, as a musical pioneer, but not as a composer or as a musician, but rather as a composer of motions, which was one thing that, a phrase that he used, one can compose motions. And so his, his artworks would go on to influence composers. And so that's something that I'll kind of plunge into um, during the presentation as well as his relationship with certain composers and the influence that his invention of the mobile, um, sound making and non-sound making that it would have on contemporary musicians. Um, and I should also mention that if we had more time, it, it, would, it would have been a pleasure to go into Calder's Circus, to go into um, his his use of noise in other works, like his motorized mobiles, which make a lot of a lot of noise, and interesting sounds, which we no longer really have because they're very fragile and, and they're rarely activated. Um, but the noise component is is uh, woven throughout his pra his practices, his different practices, and he was a great love lover of jazz music and, and contemporary music of his time. Um, but his appreciation for popular music of his day and, 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 and the swinging 20s and jazz music in Paris is something that I can, I can touch on and maybe um, answer some questions about. Um, but it's not uh, what I'll be specifically focusing on in this talk. So here is, is a drawing that Calder made um, for a unpublished um, manuscript there was a, a kind of an autobiography. And he's discussing a visit to the artist Mondrian's studio um, in, in uh, October 1930. And he's remembering the, the studio um, is these objects, paintings, not paintings, I'm sorry. These are, these are rectangular stunts, he calls them, which Mondrian had tacked up on the wall to be able to move them in different configurations and experiment with their, with their symmetry and asymmetry. And these are windows on the left and right. So he says, there are two large windows with, with light coming through. And this experience of going to Mondrian's studio was the thing that he said shocked him into becoming an abstract artist. Um, so I'm kind of jumping ahead to this moment to explore Calder sound and music. Um, where he is, uh, he is, let's see, 32 years old, and he's in Mondrian's studio, and he's, he's about to fully shift into abstraction. So he says, visiting Mondrian's studio, Mondrian even paint, had painted the Victrola, so he painted the turntable, um, the record turntable. He painted it white. He painted the Victrola right, and he had a, sen a sense of um, integrality. Everything was integrated together in the studio to create this experience of, of almost as if he was inside of his own um, spiritual practice as an, art as an artist. Here's Mondrian in the studio, a posed photograph. Another image of Mondrian's studio where he, where he lived. And here are works that Calder made um, during the two weeks after this visit to the studio. So this is just a selection um, that I put together of, of different works that Calder had made as he was so energized by this visit to Mondrian's studio. Um, so he started making these um, non-objective was the term that was being used. These non-objective works, these abstract works, um, following his visits to Mondrian Studio. You can see there's the beginning of the sort of 
kinetic explorations in in the static works themselves, where he has these very dynamic kinds of relationships between the different shapes that almost appear seem as if they're about to, to start moving. And here he is with one of the works um, at his studio at, at 7 Villa Brune in Paris in November 1930. So that's just a month after he's visited Mondrian's studio. Um, he had, as Beth pointed out in the talk uh, uh, yesterday, which I really enjoyed, he had sported a mustache, which was sort of a bohemian symbol. And notice here uh, that there's no more mustache any longer. So there's a, a, a seriousness um, which, and also uh, those things which come with this, this shift into abstraction in his practice. And here's a work from 1931 called Two Spheres Within a Sphere. Um, and since the mid-1920s, uh, he had defined mass with shapes cut from air, drawing with wire. So he was making people's portraits um, out of wire. He was depicting um, the circus. He was making wire sculptures, um, drawing in space with wire. And at this point, um, he had this new method, which he described as, when I use two circles of wire intersect intersecting at right angles, so that would be the outside and interior form here. This to me is a sphere. And when I use two or more sheets of metal cut into shaped, shapes and mounted at angles to each other, I feel that there is a solid form, perhaps concave, perhaps convex, filling in the dihedral angles between them. So he's talking about the negative space. And this strange term, dihedral, is is an engineering term that, that he would introduce these interesting terms sometimes to talk specifically about what he was trying to get at. So he's talking about the different planes and different negative spaces that you can kind of imagine in the sculpture that he was incorporating by their absence, so to speak. He says, I do not have a def definite idea of what this would be like I merely sense it and occupy myself with the shapes one actually sees. And this is um, an image of a friend of his, a composer, um, Edgar Varez, um, who a caller would meet around the same time in the fall of 1930 that he would go to Mondrian's studio in Paris. Um, Varez is with a music stand that Calder had fashioned for him. Um, and there's an inscription I'll show you a detail of in a moment that says homage to Varese, that's inscribed in wire to Varese. But um, Varese is, uh, in many ways, um, in, in different ways, as important a figure as Mondrian is to understanding Calder. Because Varese was a composer who was, who was close with visual artists. He was friends with people like Miro, Joseph Stella, Marcel Duchamp. And um, he was also an expat who moved to New York, spent most of his life in, in New York. And um, so here he is um, in New York with the Calder music stand. Um, and here's the music stand as it is now. Um, it needs some restoration. Um, but it, it looks, I mean, the strings do, but this, it looks great. So it's homage of Varese. And they were very close, so they had, they had a, a very brotherly relationship. Varese's um, student is a composer, Chu Wen Chung, and he's still alive. He's in his, his, his 90s. And he lives in Varese's home on Sullivan Street in Greenwich Village, New York City, um, and has told me about their relationship. And he says, oh, Calder would come bounding across the garden, and they would just embrace each other like big bears and brothers. And they're so close. And here... Varese and Calder have met. And just a few months later, Calder's making wire portrait. This is Varese. There's the artist, Fernand Leger. And in the same show is, oh, here they are together. Varese again. You can notice that it's somewhat different. It's, it's tricky to see, but you can see his kind of imperious gaze here with the eyes. It's, it's not a straight line, but it's, this kind of widow's peak. And here it's been bent apart somewhat. It's sort of a different looking form, but this was how Calder viewed him um, in 1931 when he made this work. 
And this is, this is a sculpture called Music, Music de Verez, um, which has been lost, and unfortunately. Um, but this was Calder's first uh, interpretation of Verez's music. I'll play some of Verez's music in a moment. And by the time that, when they met, Verez was composing uh, what was actually the first piece only for percussion for a, a concert hall. It was called Ionization. And he'd been working on it since 1929. And he finished it in 1931 after having known Calder for less than a year. And so he, he was composing this, a really wild work for lots of exotic percussion instruments. And Calder noticed what Verez was doing. And, um, and his wife, Louisa, wrote in a letter, um, Calder is, is uh, let me see if I have the precise quote here somewhere. Oh, in March of that year of 1931, Calder's wife Louisa wrote to her mother-in-law, Sandy's working downstairs, talking to Verez, the composer, whose music corresponds to Sandy's wire abstractions, so he likes to watch him work. Um, this, interestingly, is an unpainted piece of metal, meaning that it's light reflective. And when you see Calder's mobiles that are unpainted, um, it means they're meant to reflect light. So as they move, they, they cast different shapes on the wall and they, they have a, a potentially blinding effect. So this is, it's interesting to think about him interpreting a composer's avant-garde works in terms of why would it be light reflective? Why would there be a blinding kind of effect? This is an ebony black cube and a white kind of nether sphere here in another of these kind of implied sphere abstract forms. Um, Calder's objects. This is just to show testament to their kind of closeness. He, they sent each other lots of letters throughout the course of their lives and were friends for uh, almost 40 years. And um, this is just a, just a joke where Calder is saying, you should really come visit us soon. Or when I'm next in New York, I'll come and see you. And there's some kind of a phonograph with some kind of scatological joke going on here onto the and I don't know precisely, I think this is a nonsense word. They said, asking him a question, is this the cacophony, I think? Cacophony something? I don't know. Sort of frang franglais speak. And um, I'll just play an ex excerpt of this, this uh, composition ionization that, that Verez was composing when, when he met Calder um, for only percussion. So this is the first piece of music that's solely for um, non-melodic instruments, so all percussion instruments, called ionization. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
pausing that. Um, and uh, it goes on for a few more minutes. It's really fantastic. Um, and Berez was exploring these ideas of, of sound actually being a, a body moving in space, something that was traveling. Um, and and in, in terms of as physics, it, I mean, it, obviously it, it does. It travels through air molecules in shifting, uh, but, but, but incorporating that into, into the compositions was, was a wild idea of using um, different techniques that were not about, um, that not about melody to create the sensation of moving bodies of sound through space. And um, around this time, in, in around 1932, Calder made this, was working on an abstract ballet. Um, he said it consisted of a frame with rings in the two top corners um, through which strings passed from the hands to the objects, springs, discs, a weight with a little pennant. Um, and this photograph from his studio during this period, it displays the musical component of the ballet, which is a collection of tin cans, roughly organized by size, that's um, uh, festooned from a string. Uh, this was the music, he says, quote unquote. And Varese liked the ballet, but not the music. And I called it a Mary Can ballet, and it's kind of a, it's a pun. It's also a joke on on um, uh, the fact that um, Varez was not interested in disorganized noise. He he believed that music, his phrase, was organized sound, and um, these I, this idea of organizing sound to create music because of some type of latent intelligence or spirit in the sounds that needed to be organized in order for that to be made legible. So Calder was, was playing with kind of improvisational music at this point, as early as 1931, 1932. And um, Varese wasn't interested in this music that Calder was, was conjuring up, but he would continue incorporating it into his work. And so this is the first Hanging Mobile, um, 1930, circa 1932, called Small Sphere and Heavy Sphere. Um, and it's actually a musical instrument. Um, so there's a very small white ball here, it's a wooden ball, and this piece of lead, this is the heavy sphere. And if you nudge this heavy sphere just to the side, and you don't even have to give it much of a push, it sends the ball on this very, he described it as very complex uh, pendular motions, meaning it, it's like a pendulum, it goes like this, except it, it strikes the objects and moves around it doesn't always strike the objects, but it has this um, great motion creating a type of musical composition in real time. So it's, it's challenging this idea of a music which you write in advance and musicians then perform this music. Um, because these, these objects, this is one possible composition of the sculpture. Um, and you could decide to have this box um, turned over. You could put it underneath the red ball. Um, you could organize all the objects in a line. So it's a really um, strange idea to have an incomplete work of art and presenting it. Oh, this is, it is a complete work of art once you get involved with it, once you intervene and decide the arrangement of these different objects. They're also repurposed objects, apart from this gong, which he made himself. But they're all objects that he was choosing for their size and weight and difference from each other. So you have um, different sounds from these different objects, depending on their density, depending on the material that they're made out of, to really create a kind of a musical composition. And he, called, he called them impedimenta, meaning they impede the, the journey of the white ball. Boxes, symbol, bottles, cans add to the complication and sounds of thuds and crashes. Um, and he's, he's writing this to the curator James Johnson Sweeney in 1943. He's remembering this, this piece that he'd made in Paris in the early 30s and makes this drawing. And he's... Um, really excited about this work. It means a lot to him, and, and he's about to have a retrospective show at, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and so he's suggesting to Sweeney, 
I think it'd be great to include this. Um, this is something I can make again. This is what it looked like. This is his, his memory of this thing. He's saying, okay, there's this iron red ball. There was a box and this is roughly what it was like. And um, apparently Sweeney passed. It wasn't included in the show in 1943, but Calder would actually, re I'll get uh, uh, onto this a bit later in, in the presentation, but Calder would return to it again in the late 60s. And he wasn't an artist who looked behind him. He didn't remake works of art. Um, he wouldn't make an addition of, of, an, of a sculpture and make a number of the same exact thing. It was by hand. It was um, unusual that he was saying, this was a moment that was really important to me for lots of different reasons. And he goes on to, to explain the importance of the work and has a funky drawing. I call it small sphere and heavy sphere. Right, so um, the ultimate visual and oral composition, it becomes a collusion of these intervening forces, a collaboration between the artist, um, the spectator is no longer a spectator, really, There's, they're, they're an involved member of this piece and the climate. Um, and artists in Paris had employed laws of chance in Dadaist compositions before. Uh, Jean Arp was exploring in as early as 1916, um, randomly dropping objects and then making compositions from them based on laws of chance. Um, but Small Sphere and Heavy Sphere was one of the first modern artworks featuring the intervention of the spectator. Um, and prior to this work was Object with Red Ball in 1931. Um, and once again, he's exploring this notion of implying, um, implying a form with, with a sphere that at this point it's even more reduced, it's just a hoop. But there's three spheres, and he's saying here's three different um, types of sphere in, in a kind of a microverse. And the post here actually moves. So this can turn almost all the way around. And this object on the string can move as well. So you could, you could put the object closer to the post or out here. Same for this object. And this is just one possible orientation. So the whole thing can shift around. And if you get tired of looking at it in this orientation, this morning, this afternoon, it can look completely different. And this is another type of work um, later in the 30s, Calder. Um, was addressing frontal formality of painting, um, yet rendered in three dimensions, and with the introduction of motion. This is Snake and the Cross from 1936 at Pierre Gallery in New York. And this form moves as different colors, and this form also can move. And um, the variable composition of a changing foreground against a static background to create a type of performance as the paintings in motion act out a spatial drama with a cast of abstract objects. I'm quoting my, my dad, in fact, wrote that. And um, my contribution in terms of uh, conceptually here, if you think back to the composer Verez, um, Varez was describing what he was trying to do in music very, very similarly to how my great-grandfather was describing what he was after in terms of, of moving forms. So in his own practice, Calder was employing volumes, motion, spaces bounded by the great space, the universe, is what he said. But for Varez, a kind of sculptural parlance mingles with his musical uh, vernacular. So the composer was not being metaphorical when in 1936, the same year of Snake and the Cross, he said, taking the place of the old fixed linear counterpoint in music, you will find in my works the movement of masses varying in radians and of different densities and volumes. In referring to his composition Integral in 1924 and 25, he may as well have been describing a Calder abstraction, perhaps a painting in motion such as Snake and the Cross. <clears throat> 
which is spotlighting liquid evolutions of negative space circumscribed by its frame. Verez called his own piece integral the changing projection of a geometrical figure onto a plane surface, with both the geometrical figure and the plane surface moving in space, each at its own changing and varying speeds of lateral movement and rotation. And by 1933, Calder was asking the question, why not plastic forms in motion? Calder said, not a simple translatory or rotary motion, but several motions of different types, speeds, and amplitudes composing to make a resultant home, whole. Just as one can compose colors or forms, so one can compose motions. And I think, I think Varez, the composer, was very invigorated that Calder was actually achieving this, and Varez wasn't actually finding the kind of support in his own community of, of composers for these kinds of radical ideas. So coming back to this image, um, Calder, here's Calder working alone in his studio, um, apart from uh, Herbert Matter, his friend and photographer. Calder, he worked alone. He didn't use, a, he didn't have assistance. He didn't listen to music even while he was working. He had um, these objects suspended from the rafters of his studio that were making metallic noise. And so the doors are open can get very windy um, in the studio in, in Connecticut and uh, extremely hot in the summer months too. It's no AC. So all of these objects in the rafters, they're, they're clanging together. And um, uh, I'll just read something that I w wrote um, in, the, in the essay on Calder and Sound. Um, the many sculptures adrift in the rafters of his studio created an anarchic foliage like a clock wiped clean of its face, the gong loomed overhead from Calder's procurement of his Roxbury studio in 1938 until his death in 1976. So having this gong um, always present, making sound just as, as at chance was something he really delighted in. Um, and uh, the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre was a friend of Calder's and he was very inspired by visiting Calder in his studio, and so he's paid a lot of attention to this gong and the noise that this gong was making while they were um, spending time together in the studio. And he described it as, I once saw a beater and a gong hanging very high up in his studio. At the slightest draft of air, the beater went after the rotating gong. It would draw back to strike, lash out at the gong, and then like a clumsy hand, miss. And just when you were least expecting it, it would come straight at it, and strike it in the middle with a terrible noise. And here's that work. This is stitched canvas. Um, and uh, it's, this has actually a, been refabricated, I'll tell you. So this is how it looked originally. And here's another gong. It's actually very quiet, oddly. Um, it's sort of, you anticipate the, the noise, you want it to make a great noise and it moves and it just touches it and it's almost like you feel this impact but it's very, very quiet. I can imagine maybe in a very, on a very blustery day that it could make a terrible noise but I don't really see where he's getting that. This is another work um, which wouldn't immediately, I don't think, appear to be sound making. Um, it's circa 1934, an entitled work and um, yet similar to those, those frame paintings like Snake and the Cross, it has, it has mobile elements in, framed that move toward you and then move back, almost like a kind of a cinematic kind of effect. And then these objects, so this is an iron hoop and pieces of pipe which are cut out that can strike the hoop and make quite a, quite a dwong kind of sound and the wooden ball it's, a, it's almost too big to fit inside of it, so it's intentionally sound producing to, to collide with itself. It's another kind of interesting one. The fickleness of the collisions can be frustrating. They come when one least expects them to or not at all, generating another type of noise, the internal babble of our readjustments. This work from 1936 contains a vertical wire threaded through its squashed cornet. <laughs> 
trailing to a white wooden ball that dangles suspiciously in the immediate neighborhood of the black base, ready to bump against, kiss, or whack it. To me, the most important thing in a composition is disparity, Calder wrote in 1943. Anything suggestive of symmetry is decidedly undesirable, except possibly when, where an approximation of symmetry is used in a detail to enhance the inequality within the general scheme. Calder favored the term disparity to describe his practice. The idea of one body moving about another body, which is doing something else, all by itself is very exciting to me. And I think I have remained faithful to this original conception, that disparity is the spice of life. Disparity of form, size, density, color, and, and motion, and perhaps a few other things. And in an interview, um, he was asked the question, how did you begin to use sound in your work? And Calder said, it was accidental at first. And then I made a sculpture called Dogwood, with three heavy plates that gave off quite a clangor. Here was another variation. You see, you have weight, form, size, color, motion, and then you have noise. And this is, um, I'll just read this, this um, quote quickly, which refers to the next slide as well. In 1941, there was a critic reviewing his show at the Piermatisse Gallery in New York who singled out the sonic feature of this work, the clangor, or AKA dogwood, there is one mobile in particular weighted by metal discs of such tonnage that colliding, they are metamorphosed into deep-throated bongs. In boomerangs, um, this is the kind of airborne cousin of the clanger, uh, which is one of two sculptures which features these kind of chain-linked wired attachments. The other one would be lobster trash and fishtail, which is owned by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and they often show it looks amazing in their stairwell. And this is Black Tulip. I'm just going to show a variety of other types of, when he kind of really got going with this idea, I'm going to incorporate noise into my sculptures. Um, he did it in all manner of different ways. So there's a sort of gong that just rotates for a visual effect. It doesn't even make sound. And then there's very black kind of squiggly pieces of um, of, of lead, I think, um, that kind of droop down and smack the black forms of its base. Some of the noise mobiles are, are, do not make this quote-unquote terrible sound. They're, they're of a furtive, quieter stock. Um, tinkling pitchfork shards here of tines from 1943. And this black moon on the verge of being struck by one of its tentacles in this work from 1947. Here's a beautiful contact sheet of the work, kind of giving an idea of, of how it describes motion as it turns in space. And from the late 1930s through the mid-1940s, this work is from 1945, Black Foliage Red Branch. Calder suspended sonorous elements in proximity, granting them freedom to pivot and resonate. The sundry clangers of black foliage red branch represent the style in contrast to Calder's gongs with protruding strikers. And um, by the late 1940s, Calder figured out how he wanted to synthesize mobiles and gongs. And he had a show in New York at Kurt Ballantin Gallery called Calder Gongs and Towers in 1952. Um, so kind of prototypical of this refined style is this work, Triple Gong, um, which has these protruding wires that terminate in these chunks of lead, and each of them has a different pitch of the differently sized gongs. It's also a very pleasing, kind of quiet sound, like you hear the gong in small sphere, heavy sphere. Um, Calder would apply this technique where mobiles are breathing independently, yet in agreement with the gong supplements through the 1950s and into the 60s with um, many more works, many more gong kind of works. Here's another triple gong from 1941. Double gong, 1953. Those are red gongs, 1951. Sumac with gong, 1951. And um, I hope I'm kind of showing that there's this evolution, this trajectory he's taken where he's really 
looking for ways of incorporating the element of sound into the mobile so that you have these different variations going on of, of color and size and weight and noise. And um, a year after um, this period, um, uh, after the show at the Kurt Valentin Gallery with these gongs and other works, um, he gets this commission in Venezuela and Caracas for a piece of sonic architecture. Um, it's basically, it's his idea of to have, have acoustically reflective panels because he'd been commissioned to do something different um, at the uh, um, uh, Central University of Venezuela um, uh, within uh, the university city of Caracas um, outside. Um, but it turned out it would be rather complicated for what he wanted to do um, outside of the hall. So he looked inside, why don't we just do something in here? And the architect, who was um, Carlos Raul Villanueva, he said, well, there's this issue. There's all these really ugly panels. So your mobile wouldn't look good up there, be obstructed visually with, um, with the panels. He said, okay, let us play with these panels. Meaning, it's not an issue for me. I'll be able to figure something out and do something fun. So he constructed these different shaped elements. And there was actually an engineering team, um, an American engin engineering team, um, uh, that worked on these structures un under the supervision of this firm called Bolt, Berenick, and Newman, while an orchestra played on the stage to calibrate the acoustics accurately um, for perfect sound to make sure the quality remained consistent throughout the hall. Here's kind of a detail of the structure of these panels. Um, while I was preparing for this talk, I, uh, this has been one dimension of cauldron sound that I would say is my least researched area because there's so much to this particular project. I discovered, well, the seats themselves, um, where they had incorporated um, sheepskin for acoustic purposes of absorbing sounds. And these panels are even tilted to reflect sound and to mute sound. And there was so much deliberation put into this hall. So apparently it's supposed to sound extraordinary when you hear an, an orchestra performing there. And kind of moving, moving now in, in, into a new generation of composers. So a gener generation younger than Edgar Varese, um, John Cage, um, the sort of one of the uh, central figures in the new avant-garde. Um, he was interested um, for a long time in, in percussive music, so he's very interested in Edvarez's work. He was adopting the term organized sound to, for, for a while to describe what he was up to. And um, he was one of, of the composers who, who innovated um, prepared piano. So here he is taking things that he must have bought at a hardware store, screws and different kinds of objects that can create different percussive noises into a piano. And um, this is from 1947. Around this time, Calder's mobiles began to profoundly affect the course of classical music. It was by introducing new tools, new ideas into the composer's kit. The history of the mobile's influence on music is vast. One point of orientation begins in the late 1940s when artists in America and Europe began to re-engage with Dadaist ideas. When John Cage secured a foothold and drew alliance with the re-emerging Marcel Duchamp in New York. They were seeking references to authorize and articulate their strange music to find non-cloistered expression homologous to their new compositions. Pierre Boulez, Earl Brown, Roman Habenstock Ramadi, Aldo Clementi, Mauricio Cagle, Georgi Ligeti, Vitor Ludoslavsky, Henri Pissour, and others compared their works to mobiles. Mobile, stabile, mobility were terms that were soon absorbed into the musical vocabulary, having become familiar to composers through lectures and performances at the Darmstadt International Summer Courses for New Music in Germany beginning in the early 1950s. These Calder-derived concepts grew into flexible descriptors of dynamic innovations to the musical score. Mobiles, as composer Ludoslavsky described his string quartet, are passages of collective ad libitum, which the parts contain discrete repeated fragments 
The oral result is analogous to the visual effect when a mobile of Alexander Calder is viewed from different angles. The relation of part to part and part to whole is constantly changing, familiar fragments of sound returning in ever new contexts. This is a film from 1950 by Herbert Matter called Works of Calder, which John Cage scored with the prepared piano. <laughs> So there's becoming this integration of, of mobility, of really literally from the mobile into um, avant-garde musical practices. And it, explicitly in the in early, early 1950s, um, the so-called New York School of Composers, which uh, was John Cage, Christian Wolf, Earl Brown, Morton Feldman, they started incorporating these ideas of, of mobility into their scores. So this is a work called December 1952 by the composer Earl Brown. It looks like a visual work of art. It almost looks like a Mondrian, in a sense, without, without the, the bars removed. But one is supposed to, to play this score by envisioning they're moving through three-dimensional space. You start a particular side, you can rotate the score, and you begin playing through and imagining the thickness being pitch. You can, you can choose your own tempo and speed to play the piece, and you can also play with other people. It can be for a solo instrument, it could be for an ensemble. So this is really a landmark composition because um, it introduced an idea which came from the visual arts into the music world, and they actually figured out how you could incorporate these ideas um, to instruments with a structure which is identifiable, and you see this score once, okay, that's December 1952, and you, you hear it once, and you hear a completely different thing the next time it's performed. It's never really the same thing twice, so it has a mobility to it. Here's a work by the German composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen called Klavierstück 11, which is for a piano. And these pieces, there's 19 different um, phrases, pieces of music which are mobile. They can be shifted around, so you decide where to begin and where to end. And so there is a, a limited number, a very large number, of different possible permutations of this piece of music. But it's up to the pianist to determine which order in which they're, they're played. So it's really, it's breaking away from the old classical idea of a fixed linear score into opening it up more and more. Um, and this composer, Earl Brown, would, would initially call this mobile composition, and it became known, popularized as open form music. Taking cue from Calder and literary modernists such as James Joyce, Stefan Meyer May, and Gertrude Stein, composers radically reevaluated not only the musical score, but its performative implications. Proponent, proponents of the new avant-garde identified the traditionalist presumption that musicians were empty vessels to be filled, mechanisms for realizing closed, fixed scores, traditional goals of a musical performance, 
for example, the precise interpretation of a con composer's intent interspersed with displays of technical virtuosity were set in contrast to open scores, requiring active participation and decision-making by the performer. And this was observed um, in a famous work by Umberto Eco called The Open Work. Um, his first essay is about this idea of an open work, uh, 1961, I um, wanted to read uh, just a couple sentences from this book because he observed that not only does the music change every time, but you get to, to hear the um, cultural inflections of the performer. Um, the individual addressee is bound to supply his own existential credentials. The sense conditioning, which is peculiarly, peculiarly his own, a defined culture, a set of tastes, personal inclinations and prejudices. Thus his comprehension of the original artifact, the original musical score, is always modified by his particular and individual perspective. A couple more examples of open scores. So here you can begin anywhere, if you wanted to begin here, and you kind of climb. So if you wanted to stop here, or you could continue and climb there, but you could climb there and then you could climb there, and then you could climb down, and then you could go up. I mean, you can really perform this in so many different kinds of ways, and yet it has a structure which enables that kind of mobility and openness. So a mobile is a kind of a structured improvisation, because open form and structured improvisation are kind of like kissing cousins. It's, there's a lot of gray area. So this, this is a structured improvisation in a sense. It's an open form piece of music. Um, the mobile changes and yet it remains the same. And bringing this back, for example, to this object with Red Ball from 1931, which proposed this idea of a mobility of forms. The sphere and, spheres and posts can be recomposed, allowing the spectator's subjective taste to determine the final aesthetic scheme. Just a list to show you this kind of influence of, of um, this is not complete, but of scores that use the, the word um, consciously derived from Calder, mobile. And um, mobile, mobiles, graphic mobile, um, for Alexander Calder, from Alexander Calder. Basically, you know, on and on to the present day, some very well-known composers on this list. An early work by Pierre Boulez, um, in a letter, he described the difference between open and closed compositions. I was talking about open form concerning the composer in Webern, when form could possibly close itself but remain suspended. This closing haphazard and open is the worst enemy of a form. What I'm looking for is an unclosed trajectory, rather a state of suspension in time, as one speaks of a body or an object suspended in a liquid, for example. Um, it made its way into electronic music as well. This is an early piece of tape music from 1957 called Scamby by Henri Pousseur. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of tape music um, which has 16 pair, pairs of segments or layers that you can reorder or even superimpose on top of one another. And it sounds like this. is um, just beyond uh, these first ideas of what is a mobile, how can we make music from the idea of a mobile, of a, of a form which is in perpetual motion. So there's three layers, one, two, and three, these kinds of squares. And the directions essentially are there's a choice you have to begin anywhere and to move counterclockwise or to move clockwise and then you perform the entire perimeter of the piece simultaneously and he's also flirting with 
um, different ways of notating music. So there's different forms of composition within one piece of composition. And this, the um, singers incorporating um, two uh, sonnets from Shakespeare. Once again, you can begin on, in any um, phrase and move to any other phrase. So you really have freedom of choice. And this is um, uh, from the string quartet from the Polish composer Ludoslawski. Um, this idea of Calder's mobiles also having the effect of a texture, what he called a flowing, like a shimmering piece of constantly moving fabric. The first movement here consists of 13 mobiles, individualized, strongly contrasted episodes where the first violin delivers its soliloquy in an aside through pointillistic material and static rustling or flickering objects. So you can hear some of the same themes coming back and repeating itself, um, but it, it never repeats itself the same way twice when you hear a performance of the string quartet. So they have some choice in when they would like to repeat the phrases, and they have to do it collectively as well. So if one initiates it, then the others follow suit in the string quartet. This is another work by Earl Brown, who had done that Mondrian-like graphic score in 1952. This is called Available Forms from 1961. Brown um, started ad adapting the idea of the mobile to conducting. And so he said there were two basic approaches to doing that. A mobile score subject to the physical manipulation, so shifting the different pages around or the orientation of the score, resulting in an unknown number of different realizations. Or conceptually, subject to an if infinite number of performance realizations through the involvement of the performer's responses to the ambiguous graphic stimuli relative to the conditions of the performance involvement. So here he is conducting. Let's do, let's do uh, page two. I'll start on page two. So just to, just to give you a, an idea of that, um, he is, has a placard and he's moving through the different parts of the score by number, so six different sections. And um, this was the kind of literal take a mobile and break it into six parts of music. So you perform it in whichever order. But Let's he, do... he actually approached Calder in 1963 in um, Sachet in the south of France where Calder was living. And he had this idea of, of using a mo an actual mobile. And he said, I want for the mobile to conduct the piece of music. Um, and he had received a commission for a, a percussion quartet um, led by um, Diego Masson, Andre Masson, the artist Andre Masson's son um, in Paris. And so he approached Calder and in a gesture of homage to his hero, he said, I, I'd like for the mobile to conduct the piece and Calder said, that's great. That's a great idea. And um, he was immediately thrilled by this. Uh, Brown began composing a piece um, by which the, the, the colors of the mobile would determine uh, 
uh, cues for the performers. Three years later, when Calder delivered a mobile in, in Paris to Brown, um, this mobile appeared, and it was monochromatic red. And so Brown had to, to hastily readapt his score. And um, it's for uh, percussion quartet, who, who not only are, are conducted by the mobile's movements, but they actually strike the mobile. And um, Brown had, had uh, asked Calder about this idea as well, and Calder said, that's fine, I hit them all the time. <laughs> so um, they, have, they have mallets, and there's um, these sections of the score when they approach the mobile and they set it turning. And after they've set it turning, they run back to their posts and they actually interpret the gestures of the mobile. So they have to, the way that in which they do that is they superimpose the shapes of the mobile onto the score that Brown has written, just in their mind. So they visualize the mobile's elements falling onto the different moments of the score. And it's a complex score. Um, there's a lot of percussion instruments, over a hundred percussion instruments that are used by the quartet with these different timbres, metal, wood, skin, mobile, you know, and so there's a lot of different incorporating different graphic ideas, gestural ideas, so they're literally following his Earl Brown's line in different parts of the score. And so he's really trying to to fully incorporate how a mobile could both conduct and be played as a percussion instrument by a quartet. So here's um, an excerpt from a performance that I curated in 2016, I believe, in New York, of Calder Peace, um, performance by the Talajan Quartet, um, in collaboration with the Earl Brown Foundation and the Calder Foundation. This is the final movement of the piece. Thank you. 
and the entire piece is approximately 25 minutes, and that's just the, the final section, which is the most dramatic, where they really rush at the mobile, and, and it's in Brown's score, they really go for it at that point, um, and previously they're a bit more tentative and careful with the mobile, and it's very dramatic, you see them slowly approaching it and, and hitting the elements of the mobile, but I wanted to share how um, there, is, there is a sense of of noise and of, of that Calder was interested in those mobile elements being hit, that he was really excited by the idea of, of um, the interchange between the musicians, um, the interplay or the exchange, I'm trying to say. Um, and so he immediately got it, he understood what he was up to. And after the first, the premiere, uh, Brown asked him, what, do you, what did you think? And Calder said, I thought they were going to hit them much harder and with hammers. <laughs> and I don't know. They had a, so he offered to make another version of the mobile, in fact, um, out of brass that he thought would, would make a more interesting sound. But Brown said, no, I love the timbre of, the, of these elements themselves. And um, consisting of 14 different percussive sounds. So um, this, uh, this is from a film from 1963, From the Circus to the Moon, um, uh, by Hans Richter. And it was an experimental film with a kind of uh, an experimental soundtrack of African drumming and electronic sounds and backward sounds. But there, there are interesting clips of Calder making noi noisemakers. So this is, you'll hear the soundtrack to the film. Unfortunately, I wish they'd included the sound of the mobiles. there's about 10 minutes remaining in, in the lecture just to let you know. I wanted to return to, um, uh, I mentioned small sphere and heavy sphere from uh, 1930, circa 1932, and um, the Calder wanted it in his retrospective. He was the youngest artist at that time in 1943 to have a, a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and here he is in 1969, once again returning to this mobile um, for his show in, in 1969, um, preparing this, this work, experimenting with it. And um, so he's in uh, Sachet in the south of France in his studio, and he's incorporated things probably from the kitchen and other objects just to kind of figure out which objects he wants to use, different, different bric-a-brac. And um, he's chosen some of the same types of objects previously. You can see the boxes there. And this is the old small sphere and heavy sphere. And it ends up being Un Boue Noir, Un Boue Blanche, 1969, for his retrospective at the Fondation Mag in St. Paul de Vence in France. And so he's overhauled and transfigured this earlier work, Small Sphere and Heavy Sphere, under a new title one of the very few instances in which he revisited past works. In the experimental stage of this sculpture's revitalization, Calder auditioned a similar set of objects, including a wooden box, metal discs, and bowls from his kitchen. Ultimately, he did away with the bricolage and instead ordered nine steel gong-like bowls that varied greatly in size. Although uniformly in Calder red, to be fabricated 
and tuned with the assistance of an ironworks in Tour de France for Calder's Universe in 1976 at the Whitney Museum in New York. Throngs of people crown, crowded the edges of the sculpture, attracted as they were in 1969 to the sounds of solemn bells. Um, he influenced an artist named Harry Bertoya, who is a, a designer and sound sculptor, um, who followed in Calder's footsteps, um, in a sense, by formalizing the use of metal for its sound properties. So in 1960, he began stretching and stretching and bending metal rods into different formations that kind of resemble desert grasses, to my mind. Sensitive to wind and touch, these pieces approximate meteorological phenomena with thick beds of hissing tintambulation. Here's a, a work by the composer Steve Reich, the American minimalist composer called Pendulum Music. Um, I think this is Richard Serra and Bryce Martin, and I'm not sure entirely who everyone is here, but this is at um, the premiere of this work in 1968. Um, John Cage is commonly credited with, with chance-operated music by throwing dice in accordance with um, the I Ching in order to compose music and for music to be out of his control and not to be a kind of music of the ego, so to speak. But this piece, Pendulum Music, is a process-based composition as well, involving a number of microphones. So each of these um, cables is attached to a microphone. And these are actually speakers. So there's four speakers and there's four microphones. And this is the composer, Steve Reich, here, adjusting the mixing levels between the different microphones. And they're going to... Um, sort of like, what is that like? They're, they're holding the microphone, they're going to release it and then create this kind of pendulum. And they create um, chirping pulses changing in relation as the, the pendular movements taper off until finally they come to rest on, on, uh, above the speakers and you just end up hearing the different feedback in harmony from the different speakers. So they has, it has a perceptible relationship to Calder's sculpture, Small Sphere and Heavy Sphere. Both works trespass the line separating sculpture and music, though they're fundamentally different, different in motion and in personality. Here is a realization in Grenoble, France, just a few years ago. It's a very famous work. People love to perform this work. This is interesting because it's, um, it, it has um, La Cornu, which you'll see, which means gastronomic, uh, Calder work. Um, actually as part of the video. So this was kind of at the end. He positioned the speakers in different parts for different echoes um, outdoors. This is toward the end of the performance. And you can see La Cornu on the right. I just love the kind of juxtaposition of this strange new music with the Calder sculpture together. Um, and so I organized this talk chronologically. So this is, at this point, we're in the late 70s and going through um, quickly with how open form music um, started becoming adapted with, with the next generation of musical pioneers. So this is conducted by um, Butch Morris, who is a downtown New York conductor, um, who invented a way of conducting ensembles by improvising and asking them to remember what they played and then to repeat it again in accordance with his baton and his motions. This is improvisation. This is collective improvisation. This is conduction. This is conducted improvisation. This isn't uh, uh, necessarily free music. This has a focus, and I am the focus. I, I expect everybody to give me their undivided attention at all times. <laughs> 
so one might ask at this point, what does this really have to do with Alders Mobiles? And um, I'm bringing it back to essentially what the Mobile was proposing. It was, it was a new, it was an invention. It was a new um, manner, uh, it was a new art form. So musicians were very excited to, to adopt uh, a uh, ever-changing um, form into the composition, into the performance itself. So this is how it kind of became integrated up to the present day, um, where there is music which is predetermined, but the audience plays a role in interacting it and, with it and changing it and becomes even more horizontal. So this is um, a piece by a, 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 more, a younger group called Lucky Dragons, where the music, the sounds are predetermined by a computer, but people are actually interacting with skin conduction in order to change the sounds. To, to mobilize the sounds, but it's still within a structure, it's within a set of constraints. It's not as much Morris said in the, in the last video, it's not a free music entirely. There's still a, a kind of set of rules in which the music gets shifted around. So there, there are a number of projects um, that at the Calder Foundation we've tried to um, revisit different themes in Calder's work. We were doing these 12 hour long um, sort of mini festivals um, up through 2015, um, uh, as uh, Emily had said of um, interdisciplinary cross-generational performances with film, with static works, with kinetic works, with, with music. So, I put together this ensemble of improvisers to actually play Calder's scrap metal from the studio um, to kind of remind uh, myself and, and other people uh, that these were not precious objects in a certain sense, that these were scraps that he was experimenting with that were, that were colliding and creating noise. So this is an improvisation expert, excerpt um, from 2015 that was part of a multimedia program that was produced by the Calder Foundation at the Highland Hotel in New York City. Um, this ensemble is called the Vertical Foliage Orchestra, taken after the name of one of Calder's mobiles. <laughs> was with um, Alejandro Antelo Suarez, who's the son of Sandro Antelo Suarez, who curated the, the Calder exhibition in um, Buenos Aires that opened last month. He's actually singing texts that Calder had written. It's just a very experimental performance of um, combining different generations and combining objects from Calder's studio and combining philo philosophical ideas of Calder's, kind of mixing it all up together and seeing what happened. Um, and uh, last summer at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, um, there were a number of um, performers, artists, who were invited to collaborate with Calder's objects, um, including the artist Christian Markley, who invited the cellist Okyun Lee um, to work with small, heavy, heavy, small Sphere and Heavy Sphere, um, the first hanging mobile um, and a musical instrument that Calder had um, created and to uh, stage an intervention with it and do a musical performance with it.
witnesses the original work again, cleared of all of that. Um, so I hope that some of these ideas are sort of embedded and you can see how um, 70 years later, people are, are revisiting these kinds of ideas. And um, so beyond his stature as a composer of motion, Calder expanded the vocabulary of sculpture by permitting his mysterious objects, noise-making capabilities. An artist who addressed issues fundamental to composers of music, Calder was a visionary of the increasingly blurred intermingling categories of art. At a time when contemporary sound art is receiving ever-increasing attention in galleries and museums, Calder stands as a foundational figure and a primary 20th century source for compositional experimentation. Thank you very much for speaking.